Hello, and welcome to the Walrus Talks at Home Living Better. I'm Jennifer Hollett, and I am the Executive Director of the Walrus, and we are thrilled to be joining you online, connecting people across the country and beyond in conversation. Our partner this evening is Concordia University in Montreal, located on unceded Indigenous lands. The Ganyang Gay Haga Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters of the Joja Gay, Montreal. Montreal, where I was born, and Toronto, where I live right now, have long been meeting places of Indigenous peoples, and we are honored to carry on a tradition of conversation. Please take a moment to reflect on the land that you're on and this moment in history that we're in. A bit more about the walrus. The walrus started 18 years ago really as an optimistic project to tell the stories of Canada and to foster conversation. And we do this in a number of ways through fact-based journalism in our print edition of The Walrus and online daily at thewalrus.ca, through our podcast, The Conversation Piece, as well as our public event series, The Walrus Talks, which is now The Walrus Talks at Home, my home and in your home. Our work is powered by our donors, our supporters, and our partners. Thank you all for being here and joining us. One of our strongest, longest standing partnerships is with Concordia University, where I'm a grad who have made this event possible. To start tonight's conversation, please welcome Concordia University's President and Vice Chancellor, Graham Carr. Bienvenue, welcome. As we head into year two of the pandemic, I'm sure we're all ears for tonight's talks on living better. I know I am. We know the pandemic has made life immeasurably worse for people in all societies, exacerbating existing inequalities, creating unprecedented new challenges and insecurities for countless families and individuals. And of course, more than two and a half million people have lost their lives to COVID. This evening, you're gonna hear from two Concordia faculty members whose research focuses on how people respond to change and stress, adapting, coping, adjusting. Adam Radomski is Director of Clinical Training in our Psychology Department. Adam's research is on obsessive compulsive disorder and anxiety, and it's especially pertinent during these uncertain times. When the pandemic was declared a year ago, Adam was one of the first people I reached out to, to ask him what we should anticipate in terms of mental health challenges that all members of our community might face. I recall very well his advice to try to look forward beyond the stress of the immediate moment and to prepare for the more devastating impact that prolonged isolation or social limitation was bound to create. You'll also be hearing from Zenep Arcel. Zenep is a widely cited expert on tastes, brands, value and valuation, and our shifting attitudes toward consumption. The pandemic has dramatically altered consumption patterns, both for those fortunate enough to retain purchasing power, but especially for others who've seen their income vanish. Tonight, Zanep will be taking a close look at how even our most mundane everyday choices have a moral component, but also how those choices affect our interactions with others. Zanep teaches in the marketing department of our John Molson School of Business, whose MBA was just ranked 68th in the world by The Economist magazine. It's another example of why, for the past two years, Concordia has been ranked the top North American university less than 50 years old. Another factor is our commitment to joining the public dialogue on issues that matter to Canadians. And there's no better way to do this than with a great partner like the Walrus. My thanks to the Walrus team, to all four speakers tonight, and to all of you for your interest in engaging with ideas that will help us all live better. Bon soirée. Thank you, Graham. The way we live here in Canada has been turned upside down over the last year due to the pandemic. And we ultimately all want to live better and healthier lives in our communities and as global citizens. Well, tonight we have a great group of speakers who will share with us new ideas about mental health, leadership, consumer choices, and healthcare sustainability during these very disrupted times. And as we start to come out of the pandemic, we do have a unique opportunity to rethink and reset the way we live. So let's dive into this. Here's how it works. Each speaker will have five minutes. 
And once your head is full of new ideas, we'll have a moderated interactive Q&A session with the speakers and you, our audience at home. Tonight, we will be hearing from Adam Rudomsky, Professor and Director of Clinical Training Psychology, Faculty of Arts and Science, Concordia University. Loren McKeon, author of No More Nice Girls, Gender, Power, and Why It's Time to Start Playing by the Rules with the Walrus Books. Zainab Arcel, Associate Professor, Marketing, John Molson, School of Business, Concordia University. And Alika LaFontaine, healthcare advocate and rural anesthesiologist. Over to our speakers. Thank you so much. Good evening. I'm Adam Radomski. And I thought this evening I would tell you a little cats and dogs story about how science has helped us to make psychological therapies remarkably effective for anxiety disorders and related problems like obsessive compulsive disorder that I study in my lab. And the story begins with Ivan Pavlov. Now, he might ring a bell. I think most people know Pavlov for his bushy beard and his work with drooling dogs. But what most people don't know about Pavlov is his work with something that he called experimentally induced neuroses. Now, what he did was that, unfortunately, he gave the dogs um, a rather sad combination of electric shock and increasingly difficult choices. And what he observed was that after a while, the dog started to display symptoms that he likened to those that we see in people with anxiety and mood disorders. So their sleep was disrupted, their appetite was down, um, they were clearly not very happy. And Pavlov had really stumbled upon a an interesting way to understand the development of mental health problems. Unfortunately, his treatment recommendations at the time were for fresh air and bromides, uh, neither of which would be a good treatment recommendation for anxiety disorders today. And so it wasn't until much later in the 1950s when a man called Joseph Wolpe, working at the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa, using Pavlov's techniques to condition these experimental neuroses in cats, not dogs, um, what he noticed was that these poor cats seemed to show fewer symptoms of anxiety when they were being fed. Um, he saw an opportunity here. Um, ouch. And uh, what he did was that he encouraged that for people struggling with anxiety disorders, that they should gradually be exposed to the conditions in which their anxiety was prominent, but with relaxation training so that people would get nice and relaxed and then very slowly um, uh, participate in those situations which might be most difficult for them. And, and over time, what we learned was, in fact, the relaxation training itself was not necessary. Um, and it led to a fundamental recommendation of psychological treatments, scientific psychological treatments for anxiety disorders, and that is to face your fears. And that's exactly what we do in the clinic. We help people strategically and with great support from a caring therapist uh, to, to very slowly face their fears. And it works. Um, and, oh, and it works remarkably well. And over the years, by listening to our patients and clients, we've learned that it's not just their behavior that matters, but it's also their thoughts and their beliefs. And what we've noticed is that when times get rough, um, ouch, the people start to think very negatively. Um, and in my lab, as well as in other laboratories, uh, psych psychologists and other mental health scientists have begun to look at different kinds of thoughts and beliefs. So uh, in my group, we've looked at beliefs about memory and how those might lead people to check more and doubt more. Uh, beliefs about responsibility, for example, people who take on too much responsibility tend to feel anxious and engage in unnecessary and unhelpful behaviors. And more recently, my work uh, has focused on beliefs about losing control that some people have, and there's only so much you can control. And all of these have implications for the clinic. But all of the work that we've done to help people in the clinic is based on the fundamental assumption that anxious people perceive a threat where in fact there is no significant threat. And then comes COVID and all that goes out the window. We certainly wouldn't ask someone who is anxious about the virus to go and hang out with COVID positive people as a way of overcoming their anxiety. In fact, please don't do that. Um, but the wonderful news is that some of those older strategies are probably very helpful right now relaxation training, take a deep breath. Um, maybe even some of the fresh air that Pavlov recommended, go for a walk, maybe even cats and dogs. Do the things that you can do to lower your stress during these very stressful times. Interestingly, we also think that re-examining responsibility might be a helpful thing to do. Some people right now are taking on much too much responsibility and trying to do too much to control something that really is almost impossible to control. So, 
follow the guidelines of the government and of experts. Um, don't do too much more than that, even though it feels like for some of us that maybe that's what we should be doing. Of course, research in the lab continues to help us best help you. And during a crisis, sometimes it feels like all you can do is hope, but hope too is powerful. And although it might feel like this is a catastrophe, things are looking pup um, and better days are ahead. And that's not just because vaccines are rolling out um, and coming our way. It's also because the science of mental health continues to help us to improve the ways that we can help people who are struggling. And that's just what we hope to keep doing. Thank you. Hi, my name is Loren McKeon and I'm an author and journalist. My second book, no More Nice Girls examined the twisty, obstacle-filled paths women take to power and then the impossible standards they face once they get there. In it, I argued that we don't only need more women in leadership. We need to change our very idea of what leadership is and what it looks like, who can achieve it. I encouraged us to place more value on collaboration, compassion, creativity, community, transparency, and even vulnerability, qualities that often seem like the polar opposites of what we see in many popular leaders today. That book came out in 2020, um, about a week before the pandemic was declared. You know, there have been few silver linings in the past 12 months, but one is certainly the ways in which we've seen women step into leadership. In addition to Teresa Tam's chief spot at the federal level, six of the top doctors in the country's 13 provinces and territories are women. There are also many women chief public health officers at municipal levels across Canada. Together, they have shown us a new way to lead, but also to live. You know, they have defied hate, deliberate misinformation, partisanship. They have spoken out against anti-Asian racism, and they have crafted the country's new unofficial mantra, be calm, be kind, be safe. I think that we've gravitated toward people like Alberta's Dina Hinshaw and BC's Bonnie Henry precisely because they have seemed to abandon the bravado, brashness, and unwavering ego that makes many male leaders so popular in the past and still in the present. You know, these women have been neither perfect nor impervious. They have been honest and human. They have struggled just like us, broke down just like us, and have admitted to hard, impossible, and sad days just like us. They have let us see them cry. And if this vulnerability and relatability felt surprising in our leaders this past year, I think it has also felt necessary. Kindness and empathy are not just nice to haves. At the international level, when it comes to the pandemic, Studies of the world's 194 countries have shown that women leaders fared better, both in terms of infection and mortality rates. One possible reason given is that unlike men who tended to prioritize the economy, women appear to approach the crisis with one top mandate, and that is to save lives. This doesn't mean that we shouldn't celebrate our male leaders. You know, that's not what I'm saying. It means we must make a point of celebrating the women who did leadership differently during the pandemic. Or as one Guardian article put it in speaking of that study, plenty of countries with male leaders have done well, but few with female leaders have done badly. I know it doesn't feel like it, but this pandemic will end. Right now though, we are in a moment where we should ask ourselves, if it's ending means we actually want to go back to normal. I know that sounds ridiculous, but stay with me. I want us to ask, why can't our blueprint for recovery instead build something better than normal? The pandemic has exposed deep inequalities and also new ways to address them. It has handed us incredible opportunity to figure out what it means for everyone to live better and what kind of leaders we need to help us get there. My next book is called Women of the Pandemic. For it, I, spoke, I spent the past year talking to 50 women about their lives and their challenges during this past year. 
but also their visions for the future. One of the women I spoke to is Paulette Senior. She's the president and CEO of the Canadian Women's Foundation. She believes that our future better living can include things like universal childcare, inclusive education that tells history from a more truthful and anti-racist perspective, a policing system that protects everybody and doesn't cost us billions, committed non-divisive politicians. I'd like to end on something she told me during our interview. And that is when we decide that we as human beings are the priority, everything else will follow from that decision. Think about that. You know, I couldn't agree with her more. I believe that putting people and our own humanity first is how we can continue to build much needed equality and in that a vision of better living for us all. Thank you. Hi, my name is Zeynep Arcel. I'm an associate professor of marketing at Concordia University. Today, I'm gonna to talk about morality and living better, but together. How do we navigate the moral choices we make in everyday lives? How do we interact with others and the material world around us as moral actors? Whether we're aware of this or not, many of our actions, big or small, have moral dimensions. And this includes things we buy, things we consume. Think about how much you decide to tip, which car you choose to drive, or whether you drive a car at all. How do you feel about getting a haircut during a pandemic or eating indoors at a restaurant? These are all moralized decisions. More, think about how you think of others when they make those choices. How many of us judge our friends on social media for posting photos of themselves doing things that we do not approve of? The year of 2020 was also the year of many unfollows and unfriendings. My colleague Aya Aboilinian and I have been working on a series of projects that inquire about this. We're interested in how morality intersects everyday life, particularly marketplace and consumption. We find that the story of morality and markets is a long and rich one with frequent plot twists and never ending contestations. What is considered moral is a product of cultural processes. We unpack these processes and see that these are complex negotiations that involve legal, religious, political, medical, or educational systems. We can see this in the prohibition of alcohol and eventual legalization and legitimization of it in Canada. Similarly, think about how the society has challenged their beliefs about cigarettes as medical authorities revise their understandings. Same goes for single-use plastics as morally complex objects that we are reconsidering as we think about our ecological impact on Earth. How many of you feel bad about using plastic bags? How many of you did 10 years ago? For a more recent example, think what we feel about masks compared to just a year ago. How we have shifted the ways we think about masks and how institutions such as legal and medical authorities shape these thoughts and feelings is a moral matter. This small, seemingly insignificant object has become a focus of cultural, political, and interpersonal tensions. Morality is about social consensus on these judgments, but also usually the lack of this consensus. When we talk about morality in the marketplace, we can see it at different levels. At the most abstract level, moral tensions shape the society even intersecting legal frameworks such as mandatory mass requirements of legalization of cannabis. But morality also affects how we live with others as social beings and how we relate to our friends and families. Aya and I study this in the context of veganism and how what we feel about consuming animals shapes our interpersonal relations. Who gets to be invited to a holiday dinner? And what is placed on the dinner table is all about morality. A family member not eating the center place can, be upset, uh, can upset the host, but so as the guests who might be feel pressure to eat animals in a holiday setting. Conflicting moral positions can cause fractures in interpersonal relationships, including those with very close family members. Morality is about these judgments and the choices shaped by these judgments. What we think of us as choices about personal aesthetic or lifestyle matters frequently have moral foundations. This can be the size of our home, the coffee we drink, the meal we eat, or our clothes. And we cannot escape the ways morality enters into our everyday lives. We have to live with the weight of everyday negotiations we have to make between being moral citizens 
and having a meaningful and pleasurable life. But seeing ourselves as entangled actors in a network of moral relationships and processes could also help us make better choices not only for ourselves, but also the society we live in, as well as the earth, our non-human companions, um, that anybody that we share it with. It can help us to check back on our strong reactions to others' choices. It can help us find more meaningful ways to manage moral tensions. It can also help us to better understand our position in a society and how our seemingly small choices, eating out in a restaurant, have impact for others. What seems personal is always relational. Socrates had set the foundations of a moral philosophy that still remains relevant, that we need to examine our lives continuously to set not only the best life lives for ourselves, but also for others. We as moral citizens have to continue to navigate this every day for living better. Since the start of the pandemic so many months ago, an increasing number of Canadians have become armchair epidemiologists and public health experts pontificating about the underlying assumptions of the pandemic and the data that drives decisions. It's important to acknowledge and properly consider expert advice, but critically thinking through decisions that affect your life directly is one of the byproducts of this pandemic that's actually very positive. When I look back at the most impactful moments of my own advocacy, asking questions and challenging assumptions has been central to making a difference. I regularly ask myself the question, does what I believe and the assumptions I accept move forward the change I want to see in the world? In this walrus talk, I'd like you to critically consider the following statement. Austerity will lead us to healthcare sustainability. For those unfamiliar with the term, austerity is a strict economic ideology that governments impose to control growing public debt defined by increased frugality. Sustainability is defined as the ability to be at a system level that can be maintained at a certain rate. Taken together, austerity leading to health system sustainability means that an ideology of frugality will lead to being able to maintain a system at its current rate and level. The arguments behind this statement are well-worn. Compensation has outpaced relative increases in other sectors. The wages of paying healthcare workers makes up the majority of healthcare system costs, and this is an inherently bad thing. If we do not decrease public spending on healthcare, it will become unsustainable and this will be out of the government's control. But let's critically look at each one of these statements. First, has compensation really outpaced relative increases in other sectors? When looking at the pace of compensation, the reality is that healthcare spending has not been rising at a continuous level. From 1976 to 1991, there was a steady increase in government investment in healthcare. From 1992 to 1996, governments cut back spending to balance budgets. And from 97 to 2008, we returned to investment. Since 2008, austerity has returned and cost cutting continues to accelerate in recent years. Secondly, are the wages of paying healthcare workers making up the majority of healthcare system costs and is this inherently a bad thing? Having staff being paid to provide care would actually make a lot of sense when considering, considering proportionality in healthcare spending. Wouldn't you want the major cost driver to healthcare be providers interacting with patients providing care? Third, if we do not decrease public spending on healthcare, it will be unsustainable and will this really be out of the government's control? No cost in government ever goes out of control because government spending is a choice. When the government can't control, however, is the political consequences of these choices. Finally, back to the original premise, has austerity made the system more sustainable? Consider what we've discovered in the midst of this pandemic. Our healthcare system is on the edge of unsustainability. The primary reason behind lockdowns was overwhelming public healthcare system concerns. The thresholds for lockdowns have in large part been related to hospital admission rates and ICU admission rates. It's clear when you look at small differences and how they can have catastrophic impacts, it's a fact that we have very little resilience within the healthcare system to deal with increased demand. Also consider what we've learned about healthcare workers in the midst of this pandemic. Pre-existing issues have accelerated and become magnified. Burnout is out of control among healthcare workers. Each of us has been sacrificing ourselves, relationships, livelihoods, health and wellness 
to make sure patients don't fall into the cracks we know are there. I've seen many colleagues walk away from careers that require decades of investment. Working environments are simply untenable in many parts of the country, and healthcare workers are leaving to pursue other jobs. Has austerity made the healthcare system more sustainable? I think the answer to this is multi-layered and is different when talking about what government, providers, patients, and their families want. But the premise that an ideology of frugality will maintain the health system at a level where we can maintain services is not only flawed, it's untrue. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we need to endlessly spend either. It means we need to make better choices. I hope you personally take a moment to unpack this question yourself. Just like decisions around the pandemic that have impacted your life directly, continuing down the path of austerity in hopes of sustainability will have impact on your life for years to come. Thank you so much to our speakers, Adam Radomsky, Loren McKeon, Zainab Arcel, and Alika LaFontaine. I also wanna say hello to all of our audience members. Taking a look here, we have audience members registered from all over, Whitehorse to Calgary, Churchill to Brampton, to Halifax and beyond. We also have many Concordia alumni with us this evening, including me. I'm Bachelor of Arts Specialization, Journalism and Communications, 1997. We encourage everyone at home. We want you to share your thoughts and reflections on social media. So feel free to post on any of the platforms. You can tag us at the Walrus and use our hashtag, hashtag Walrus Talks. It's now time for our Q&A session. To submit a question, you can ask it in the Zoom chat box. And thank you so much for all of your feedback so far in chat. All right, our speakers are now gonna join us. I'll start by asking some questions and then we're gonna get to as many audience questions as possible. All right, great to see you all. I'm gonna start with you, Adam. I must say, I was tickled by your cats, dogs, and puns. So I must ask, what role does humor play in our mental health and, and living better? Well, <clears throat> I think that it's, it, it's an important question and I think it really depends. I think if you're like me, it plays a central role. I think everybody is different. Um, my, my sister um, hates jokes um, and so, um, it might play less of a role in hers, but I think being able to laugh during difficult times is a really valuable skill set. And I think that is true in everyday life. I think it's also true when you're working on very difficult things or when you're struggling. Um, Does so your sister, hold on, hold on. Does your sister hate jokes or hate your jokes? Uh, maybe the latter. <laughs> well, I appreciate it, uh, especially because it is heavy time. So it, it's nice having that, that, that balance. And I'm, I'm sure your students also get a kick out of that. Loren, uh, I wanted to ask you, this recession and pandemic has been described as a she-session. And I'm wondering if you think as society that there is a larger understanding of a gender lens? I mean, I think that we're getting there I, a lot, but we're not quite there yet. Um, and I think that's because there's a huge resistance to see things through a gender lens, right? We still have that sort of pervasive resistance. We don't want to see things through a gender lens. And we saw that even with the she session, you know, a lot of people um, didn't want to believe that. There was a lot of, just like with the pay gap, people still think it's mythical. We saw a lot of people really pushing back against the idea of the she session, even though data has continued to support it throughout the pandemic. Yeah, I guess there's still a lot of education and understanding, but uh, it's important, similar to discussions uh, around race, to recognize gender and other identities for us to understand what's happening around us, especially because it's been so apparent with the impact of the pandemic. Zainab, listening to your talk, you know, I think about consumer choices and, and my poor mom when her two daughters, we went vegetarian in high school. But when we talk about consumer choices, when do consumers feel they have the most choice? Is it during a buy, like a boycott when you're not spending your money or is it when you're actively buying something? That's a very interesting question. Um, I don't know, actually. I don't know. I mean, it's, I, I think it depends on also your 
social background and upbringing. Um, the idea of, I think, um, sort of the perception of choice is a factor of your social class and how you have a cut like sort of internalize the feelings of scarcity, for example. So if you have uh, grown up with a sense of scarcity, uh, you will always be feeling um, like you have no, no agency or no choice, right? Uh, regardless of the options you are. So um, I look at choice in a more of a class lens and I see that how social class and, and, and backgrounds actually shape our perceptions and our our um, sort of our agency or perceptions of agency. Um, so I don't think it's the context. It's actually about who you are and how you have how you have experienced life uh, up to that point. And does that change when the group is larger, when consumers come together, say through organizing, or there are larger trends? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a sense there's a there's a range of studies that look at how we feel empowered by being together. Um, how we can actually, and there's also a lot of studies that show that how we can change markets and how we can make things better by, by bonding together and with collective action. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. LaFontaine, congratulations on your election as the Canadian Medical Association's president elect. As you reflect on the last year, and I know you're still in it, but what can leaders in all sectors learn from healthcare workers? Because you know, there's so much great admiration for the work you're doing and, and the sector at large, but what can we take into other fields of work? Yeah, I, I've been following the chat and some of the questions that have been thrown out as well. And I think it kind of dovetails into that question that you asked. Um, I think admiration and using words like sacrifice and hero, et cetera. I mean, as, as healthcare workers, we're, we're really grateful for the appreciation from the public, but I think sometimes those are used as reasons why it's okay to accept the status quo. You know, the, the emerging threat to healthcare in Canada is actually not under-resourcing, it's healthcare worker burnout. You know, I see lots of colleagues going through the past year who have come to the conclusion that they just can't live this way anymore. You know, there was a period of time from August to now where I actually haven't taken any vacation or any leave uh, except for kind of the, the one week winter break. And that, that's just not sustainable when every single day you're, you know, bombarded by the weight of this pandemic. You know, we're all suffering in Canada right now, uh, but there's a unique kind of suffering going on in the healthcare system right now. And uh, I think in, in what I was trying to share tonight was this idea that maybe instead of accepting things like austerity and efficiency and having a connotation that's inherently positive that goes along with those, maybe we should instead consider those as competing priorities. You know, burnout among healthcare workers is a competing priority to, you know, efficiency. You know, it's a competing priority to patient safety. It's a competing priority to, you know, other things that I think we've really come across in, in this past year. And I, I'm really hopeful for the coming years because I think patients and the public in general are much more dialed into this conversation. I appreciate also the, the honesty. I think we really need to talk about what, what's going on beyond the banging of the pots and pans and, and, and the heroes, which is, I think, our way of expressing our, our thanks, but taking a look at the deeper issues and ultimately the trade-offs that, that you speak of. I want to loop back to, to Adam. I mean, so much of our life is around the, the pandemic, but there is a lot of hope that the end is near, or at least that there will be a, a post-vaccine world. And you know, there are questions on how do we reintegrate when things open back up? And I'd be curious with your line of study, do you have any advice for coping with that type of anxiety, right? There's the COVID act anxiety, but then what about the new normal anxiety? Well, I think change is hard and um, we all know that. Um, and and we've, we've been learning it for the past year. And I think that applies to both positive and negative changes. So some of us have been waiting for things to return to normal. Um, I, I'm not sure that that's gonna be the best phrase. I think some people will be happy to embrace whatever new changes are, are made available to us. I think other people will be scared um, of doing things, whether it's differently in the future or similarly, you know, or, or similarly to how they used to be. I think we've, we've gotten used to some things and um, we're gonna have to change moving forward. That's not gonna be easy for everyone. Yeah. 
uh, that that's my hope is is that there can be both right that uh whether you call it hybrid or just the way we evolve right that you learn from the situations that you've experienced and you you take the good you take the bad and and you you build from it we're starting to get audience questions so thank you to everyone who has submitted a question and, and keep them coming we want to get to as many as is possible Zainab, we have one from Kathleen, who's a former student. Kathleen asks, you mentioned that 2020 is the year of unfriending and unfollowing. Do you think that this is ultimately a healthy strategy to cut people out of your life that are having different morals than you? Or does the moral tension have a place in helping to define our identity? Hi, Kathleen. Um, so I think we need to see ourselves in the context of relations and also as someone we have access to resources to cope with that kind of tension. So for, for everyone who is, uh, and I'm gonna go back to my research with Aya, we see that the way people are coping with moral tensions is uh, directly related to how they can actually equip themselves in terms of, for example, their physical and mental health, but they're also resources um, and, and even their discursive strategies, how can you convince someone, how can you actually talk to someone that you're right and, and make a point? Um, so there are points where I think it's absolutely unnecessary to continue uh, to engage yourself in a moral dilemma with someone or attention with someone, because we have to think about, we have to practice self-care too. Uh, but you, uh, and there's also, I think there's a degree of which moral tensions are, you know, the, the, it's, it's a continuum, right? Um, so um, whether we are gonna break up with mom because mom wants to put chicken broth in soup is completely different than, um, things that might be, you know, just deal breaker. And then also how we relate to that situation. I know that my answer is always, it depends, but this is how I also study things is that really it's a complex net of uh, network of relationships. But I've seen that in the pandemic, since we are so depleted and since we're burned out, we choose to not fight. We choose to actually retreat. And there's a reason to that. And I think um, we have to respect people for doing that because we're all struggling. Or do we ever fight when we don't mean to? <laughs> yes, of you know, course. Like really, you know, on the edge, and it seems like a fight, but it, but it's actually, you know, burnout or, or just feeling frustrated and exhausted. Yeah. You know, I, I found your presentation pretty fascinating. I, I found in the midst of this pandemic, I didn't realize how many of my close friends and even family are anti-mask or vaccine hesitant. You know, and it, it's interesting how. And I obviously don't do research in this area, but it's interesting how once you get online, even though it's your face and your identity and everything, it's like it unleashes, uh, you know, the actual thoughts behind the facade, you know, and I've even found with colleagues that they're much more extreme online in their personas than when we talk face to face where they're much more balanced in other things. And uh, that, that's been fascinating to experience over the last year. Well, Loren, I also can't help but think in regards to gender, you know, your talk encourages us to embrace kindness and empathy as valuable leadership traits. But then your title of your book, which is with uh, the Walrus Books, is No More Nice Girls. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on what's the difference between kindness and, and niceness, but especially as it relates to, to women. Yes, I think this is something that I definitely have been asked before. And I think, you know, I do think there's a difference between niceness and kindness. And I think that, you know, when we think of niceness, particularly when it comes to gender, it can often feel like a double-edged sword, you know, in the sense of like, oh, isn't she so nice? Or like, she's just a nice person. You know, it's kind of a way to dismiss women usually, um, or, you know, she's not nice enough um, to dismiss them again from leadership for being too aggressive or too assertive. Um, where I think, kindness is actually a practice and it's an intentional thing where um, you know kindness to me is associated with a quality toward treating people with the same um, opportunity to understanding and I think that you know that is very different and much more active than just being nice and I think when it comes you know to the pandemic kindness really is wearing a mask 
to protect people around you. Like, you know, that kindness is, you know, caring for other people and how they might be doing and, uh, you know, caring for our elderly, for instance, even though we might not be elderly ourselves, caring for our essential workers and our frontline workers, even though we might not be there. That to me is a practice of kindness. Yeah, I have to say that's one thing I really enjoyed about the pandemic. I live in downtown Toronto. It's a big city. You're lucky if you get a nod on most days and there are more smizes, right, for the people wearing the mask, but people looking to connect and no, you go first or like, I, I find that we're so desperate right now for, for connection. There is a generosity and in, in kindness at, at, at large that we're, we're seeing in the pandemic. Okay, a bunch of chat questions coming in. Uh, Alika, people are really connecting uh, with your talk on austerity, austerity and Edie specifically wants to know how the academic community can help advocate against healthcare austerity. Yeah, so I, I think that academics are really the thought leaders of medicine. So whatever we write and whatever we focus on in our research projects, that really sets the stage for where the conversation goes over the next five to 10 years. And if you look at literature within, you know, business of medicine and within different focuses of, uh, you know, care and other things, we, we've been so fixated on, you know, this panacea of efficiency and efficacy that I think we've really eliminated the human factor you know, how many quality improvement metrics ask the nurse on the floor whether or not they feel safe accepting an acute care patient when they're managing another eight that kind of have the same level of acuity? Or how many QI studies look at whether or not a patient feels safe coming out post-surgery when they have a complex chronic disease uh, kind of milieu and uh, they're kind of moving around within what's moving around? You know, I, I find that patients are very apologetic when you tell them that the healthcare can't healthcare system can't do certain things, but there are some things that we should always expect the healthcare system to do. We should always feel safe. You know, we should always do things safely. We shouldn't put ourselves in situations where we're doing something knowing full well that we don't actually have the capacity to do it. And I, I think that that's a huge role for academics to start speaking up and out about these things. I, I would love to see, you know, people writing more about, uh, you know, the, the connection between how people feel on, on surgical floors and medical floors and emergency rooms and clinics and how that translates into the lived reality of what's going on. I, I remember going through as a medical student with a, an elder in my community and we, we passed by someone who, uh, who we thought was homeless and they turned to me and said, you know, is homelessness a problem? And I, I was quiet as I thought about it. And the elder went on to say, you know, if you're an academic, then you'd say that you have to do a, a, a multi-level trial in order to actually count all the homeless in the community before saying it's an actual problem, you know? And this is the power of academia is you're the validators of truth. You're kind of the thought leaders. And so uh, having more people talk about austerity and, you know, not just trade-offs, but actual choices. Like we are designing a system as we move forward. I, I'd really love to see that kind of moving forward. Yeah, no, I like that, is moving away from the idea that there is a trade-off, but that we can make active choices, and that's government, but also extending that to other fields as well. In regards to academia, uh, we have some, uh, some questions for our Con Concordia profs. Uh, this is one, Adam, coming from Marine. Can having been treated successfully for depression in the past help us develop some kind of immunity? Yes, although it depends a little bit on, that's, that's such an interesting question, on, on how you've been treated. So okay. for example, the most common treatments for depression and anxiety disorders are antidepressant medications. And, they're, and they work, they're helpful. There is some evidence that when you stop them, um, that those problems are more likely to return. Um, in the psychology world, um, the evidence-based treatments that we used are, are usually in one of the families of something called cognitive behavioral therapies. Um, that's the kind of work that I do. It's an evidence-based psychological approach. And because that is based on giving people skills to manage their anxiety and their depression and other aspects of their lives, that once you've been treated, you can always use those skills. One of the things I like to say to my own patients, my own clients, is that my number one job is to put myself out of a job. And the best way that I can do that is to give you my job. And so that if you become your own therapist, then you won't need me again. Um, and so absolutely, that, that is the case. 
Great. Laura, we'd love to hear as you have been gathering your notes from the women of the pandemic, you know, what some of your reflections are in regards to the learnings and how it connects to our conversation tonight and, and how we live better. <laughs> That's a big question. <laughs> and I think, you I know, part of, you for the big question. Yeah. <laughs> part of the reason I think it's a big question is because, you know, I think at the beginning of the pandemic, we talked about, you know, there was this kind of idea that the pandemic would be the great equalizer. And we've learned since then that it isn't. And, you know, many people have experienced the pandemic differently, but also many women themselves have experienced it differently, depending on what communities they're in, if they're racialized, you know, if they have the ability to work from home, you know, where they are working, health levels, mental health levels, all of these things we're talking about. So I think that when it comes to the idea of living better, we have to acknowledge that, you know, many people did not have the privilege of working from home and the comfort of working from home. And they didn't, you know, they did not experience the pandemic that way. Many women struggled um, a lot. <laughs> and I think when we, when we think about living better, we have to really, as we come out and as we, you know, think about recovering what that looks like, we have to put those people first instead of last. You know, when we look at recovery, we have to start putting, um, these women as the priority and we have to start thinking better about our racialized communities about our um you know street involved communities about people that um, really bore the brunt of the pandemic and continue to do so so i think you know big question about living better but i think you know where we have to start looking for the answer is how to look how to live better is that the people that um really fell through the cracks during the pandemic and what it would mean for them and for everyone to live better. Yeah, and there has been so much learning and growing in the pandemic and, and also a big call to action for greater racial, racial justice coming out of last summer. And Zainab, I'd love to bring you into the conversation here. Are we as a society waking up? Is there a greater awareness in regards to how we make decisions and how that might connect back to who we support, whether that's a small business or a black owned business. Curious what you're seeing in terms of last year and this year and how it carries over. I think we're getting more polarized. I think we're waking up in certain ways, but we're also seeing a lot of backlash and more bigger moral gaps, bigger moral conflicts. Um, and even on issues that we think are smaller, right? Um, so, um, I mean, there is hope, but at the same time, I think the, the path to whatever we think is good, and, and this is something that I do wanna highlight is that, I mean, there are universal morals, but also at the same time, some of the things are ideological, right? So, uh, there, but there are big ideological tensions in terms of, um, as we said, how we main, how you manage, um, the pandemic, how we, uh, how, whether we believe in global warming and how we manage the, the resource depletion issues. So um, I am a bit, I'm, I tend to be a pessimistic person. So I see that there's turmoil. I just don't know what's gonna be the outcome of the turmoil. You are keeping it real for us and I appreciate yeah. that. And that connects to the question for Adam, you brought up global warming, the climate crisis, Zainab. Chris wants to know, Adam, what do you recommend for your patients with climate anxiety? Yeah, I mean, so bad news first. Should we start with the bad news? You know, it it doesn't look good. Um, there, there's there's a lot out there that doesn't look good. And actually, it, it relates to another question that I saw on there about what can you do uh, with people who are not following government guidelines? Because whether it's about climate or it's about seeing things in your life that you don't like, that you believe to be wrong, that other people are saying are wrong and are problematic. I think when it comes down to it, we all only have influence over a very small sphere of the world. It's our own world. You, 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 know, you, you have full control over what you do, over what decisions you take, over what strategies you follow, what, you know, whether, whether that's about the pandemic or about being environmentally uh, mindful. Um, <clears throat> You have very, very little ability to influence the decisions of others. You might have some that might go well. It might go very, very badly. Um, it might cause conflict. 
Um, and so I think what I would encourage people to do in either of those scenarios or in other scenarios where you don't have full control is to focus on the things that you can um, have an influence over, live the best way that you can according to your values and goals um, and hope that other people will see the wisdom in that. Um, it's unless you're a government official, um, <clears throat> you know, your sphere of influence is much smaller, but those small spheres do add up. And I think that's important to remember. I think all the people who are, are following the guidelines, who are making environmentally conscious decisions, we are making a difference. Um, it might not be as much of a difference as each person would like, but it's important not to forget that. That's the thing hearing in all of your values it comes back to our values and then the values that we prioritize as a country and as a society. Alika, Jenna wants to know, how do you propose fixing our healthcare system? And you definitely have shared some ideas. And I'm sure you're asked this a lot. It's a, a big part of your new role. So, you know, where does one start? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that when the provinces are asking for that $28 billion infusion uh, from the federal government, that's needed within the healthcare system. But we don't need to expand. We need to stabilize. And what I'd encourage patients to do every time that you go into a hospital or a clinic or other things, I actually ask these questions about sustainability, ask about the mental health of the people who are, are providing you service, ask whether or not they feel like they're more safe, and then start writing letters. You know, um, there, there used to be a running joke with family members who got into politics that if you got a single phone call, you kind of think about it, you get two, you kind of think that there's a bit of a pattern. Once you hit five, it's now an election issue and you better take care of it or else you're out the next uh, next kind of round. And, you know, un unless patients start to make this an issue, you know, making sure that we stabilize the healthcare system, make sure that the the cutting that we've done as far as efficiency has, has maybe gone too far in some places. You know, it's putting too much of a burden on people. It's creating too, uh, too high degrees of, of uh, instability or, or environments that aren't, aren't necessarily safe. Um, you need to start writing letters and, and letting administrators and, and representatives that, that you send to, you know, your, your seats of leadership and government, uh, knowing that this is, this is not okay. You know, even, even when you read about austerity inside the, the news, you know, Alberta, where I work, uh, you know, they, they brought in an austerity budget. It is what it is. You know, the economy is what it is. None of us are going to say otherwise. Um, but when they talked about cutting things, there wasn't much in the news about whether or not there was wisdom behind how far they were cutting. You know, there was this connotation that any cuts are good. And unless we start speaking out against these things, uh, we won't actually lead to, to better decisions. Whenever you're making choices within health, it's always kind of waiting what the biggest priority is. And I think we, we don't put a high enough priority on, on safety and wellness as we should. And that, that will lead to better, better choices and better decisions. Which is incredible considering the situation we're in right now. Absolutely. You know, when, when Lauren talked about, uh, you know, the pandemic being the great equalizer, I think what it did is it revealed all the inequity that was always there, but people just didn't realize was there. Yeah. And, and, and that is what we all have to pay attention to and carry over when we go back to a post-vaccine new type of normal. Is, is not forgetting that because everything has really been shoved in our faces lately in a way that we can't escape it. And I think as we examine what living better means, uh, we have to take that opportunity to reflect not only on our own lives, but what's around us and how we are all connected in those uh, inequities that exist. Thank you so much everyone for your questions and to our, our talkers, we're at time. Adam Radomski, Loren McKeon, Zainab Arcel, and Alika LaFontaine. Really appreciate your insights and talks this evening. Now, if you enjoyed tonight's events, there's more. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that right now. Coming up, Brain Canada presents the Walrus Talks Mental Health. That's taking place next Thursday on March 25th. Visit our website, thewalrus.ca slash events. That's where you'll see our schedule. You can register for any of the events you're interested in, uh, which are free. You can also watch videos from our previous talks in the Walrus Talks video room on our website. And some of you are asking in chat, will we be posting the video from tonight's event? Absolutely, that will become available. So make sure to keep an eye on that. Also, 
we will be sending you an email as a follow-up. If you would like to attend future events like this one and stay in touch with what we're doing at the Walrus, please sign up, opt into that newsletter. It's the best way to ensure that you don't miss a thing. The Walrus is unique in Canadian media because we're a registered charity and that allows us to produce our award-winning journalism, our events and podcasts because we're able to do it with the support of our community of donors and sponsors. So if you enjoyed this free event this evening, please make a donation at thewalrus.ca. You'll see that there's a donate link there. Thank you to Graham Carr, Joanne Pelletier, Philip Beauregard, Shermian Harvey, and everyone at Concordia for making this conversation possible. We'd also like to thank our annual sponsors, Inspire Labatt Breweries of Canada, Air Canada, and Shaw. Community is really important in these COVID times. You know, we talked about some of the challenges we're in tonight, but coming together is really important. And we thank each one of you for being a part of the Walrus. Thank you so much for tuning in. Have a great evening. <laughs>